All right, this is our next rhetorical theories lecture. It's about Roman rhetoric. Nice follow-up to Aristotle and the Greeks. Um, there's an awful lot to cover in Rome and Roman rhetoric. It's a giant expanse of history, uh, but I'm just going to hit some highlights. There isn't a lot that's terribly new or something that uh, dramatically opens up something that you've done before but definitely worth learning about. Uh, opening slide here, this is the uh, um, the 14th annual duty-free conference that Philip Morris had <laughs> in the European Union region in 1995 and on it is this interesting picture of Romulus and Remus who are the two infants who in a legendary fashion founded Rome and they were raised by a she-wolf and that's what that is a depiction of. Anyway, uh, you remember that in um, discussing Greek rhetoric, we were talking about uh, rhetoric basically between the 5th and the 3rd centuries BC. Now we're going to jump ahead 100 years, and we're talking about the period from 200 BC all the way up to 300 AD, so a 500 year period. And Roman rhetoric had the following characteristics. It borrowed a lot of things from the Greeks. Um, there was a lot of practice, meaning that in the Roman Empire and the Roman Republic before that, um, there were a lot more forums or a lot more venues, uh, situations in which to use rhetoric. For example, the legal profession expanded way beyond what it was. In Greece, uh, Romans for the first time had the idea of prosecutors and uh, attorneys and people who could represent you and uh, one of the people that we're going to talk about at some length Cicero was actually famous as all three a, uh, a teacher a practitioner and also an attorney and there was a lot of rhetorical teaching because a lot of people as part of their citizenship and upbringing in the Roman uh, civilization had to be effective at public speaking so the three leading characters are Cicero, and by the way, uh, the Romans probably would have called him Cicero, uh, but we don't say it that way. And he was the greatest Roman orator. Uh, we have an amazing extant library of his work, his speeches, his letters, his diaries. Um, also, there's a lot of history that's been written about him. The, Romans were fanatical record keepers, and so there's a tremendous amount of detail about what went on in the Roman Empire. So it's possible to write a history about Rome that's almost like writing modern and contemporary history because we know many, 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 many details. Um, Quintilian was a, a later teacher of rhetoric. Um, he taught in um, uh, 35 to 100 AD in the part of the Roman Empire that we now call Spain. Uh, in a second I'll show you a map that shows you that the Roman Empire extended throughout the Mediterranean, both north and south of it, east and west of it, uh, had tremendous influence throughout Europe. It truly was an empire. And then finally we have uh, Longinus's On the Sublime, a Greek work that was written in 213 or he was, lived between 213 and 273 A.D., but a Greek work that was written during that time and became very influential on interpreting the Bible because it raised the idea that language had the ability to lift people to a very high levels of revelation, appreciation, aesthetic beauty, and power, that language is not just ornamentation but has tremendous deep effects on audiences. Anyway, here's a picture of the Roman Empire, um, and you can see how far it extended. By the way, one of the things that doesn't show up in this map very well is that it also even extended into England. Uh, but this is what we usually think of when we think of the Roman Empire. Italy, France, Spain, all of North Africa, uh, parts of what's today Turkey and Greece, and even the Holy Land and all of Northern Africa, including Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Libya, and so forth and so on. So tremendous influence. Um, lots of structure. Went from a representative republic 
to a to a tyranny and empire and uh, maintain power for 500 years believe it or not um, one of the things about Rome that both distinguishes it from and um, but also makes it like Greece is that it loved art architecture poetry philosophy learning and there are many beautiful buildings uh, in Rome, some in the form of ruins or partial ruins that are extant, but there are some that are actually completely intact. And this is the best example of a completely intact ancient building. It's called the Pantheon. It's in Rome. It was obviously originally some sort of temple or other official building that the Romans used. But it, as I said before, it stayed intact throughout history. And today it's a church, but it's also a a huge tourist attraction and there are many famous Italians including Raphael buried inside of it it's absolutely beautiful if you ever get the chance to Rome must visit the Pantheon here's the inside of the Pantheon dome ceiling and again the Romans had through the uh, use of concrete and other things that uh, hadn't been used before um, were able to do amazing things like build domes and also build bridges and uh, that was a great advancement and by the way all through the Middle Ages and early Middle Ages even up through the Renaissance that technique had not been remastered so if you've ever heard the story of them trying to build the cathedral in Florence they couldn't figure out how to make a dome on the roof because they were trying to support it with wood and bricks and mortar and stones but they didn't know about the idea of this type of monolithic dome built out of concrete that could support its own weight. Just another shot shows the beautiful sunlight. And by the way, that's an open uh, sunlight there. It doesn't rain that much in Rome, but when it does rain, the rain comes in there. But that sunlight, it's also obviously a way to tell what time of day it was based on the position of the sun. One thing the Romans did did, did that the Greeks did not in their monumental architecture was they built arches and they were mostly to um, portray or commemorate the victories in um, military campaigns so when an emperor would send the Roman legions the centurions to fight in a battle if they won they would build an arch in honor of that and you could see that there's details up in the arch of all the victories and the battles that they won and of course probably the most famous of all buildings in Rome is the Colosseum and the Colosseum is a gigantic pre-modern stadium it's on the scale of stadiums like we have today um, it was huge again it included elements of both um, uh, marble concrete brick mortar all kinds of modern construction techniques largely intact today you can still visit it um, and was used as uh, they always depicted in the movies for gladiator fights but also for other athletic events and there were even some oratorical contests for rhetoricians that were held in theaters and stadiums throughout the Roman Empire this is the uh, Castel San Angelo which is the I think originally was perhaps the tomb of a of a Roman Emperor but then later became a uh, religious building part of the Vatican the Vatican is just up the way a little bit there and I think at one point in history there's a famous story about a Pope who was kidnapped and was held in the Castel San Angelo it's right on the Tiber River this is the Roman Forum these are the ruins of what was the central uh, colonnade an area of Rome. Rome was a, uh, obviously a, a busy congested city in the ancient world. It probably had well over a million people. Uh, beautiful um, gigantic uh, buildings made of marble um, and, and very active community in the arts. This is a, uh, a ruin that's in Tivoli which is a little bit north of Rome I believe maybe 45 minutes to an hour uh, this was Hadrian's villa and uh, it's still there today intact you can see it 
one of the really great things about it is it has all these water fountains that work entirely on gravity without pumps or electricity of any sort and so they I guess the belief is that they've been continuously running without power since ancient times with no need of uh, adjustment and some of you who have studied or learned about the history of Rome probably know the story of the doomed civilization of Pompeii uh, it was destroyed when lava from um, a volcano came into the town and uh, one of the things that's there as a result of this is the actual preserved bodies of the people who were covered over in the lava and as the archaeologists unearthed this they actually found the people in the exact position in which they died sometimes sitting or standing with uh, looks of agony on their faces they had some of these by the way at the Cincinnati Museum Center last year when they had an exhibit on Pompeii now let's move on to Cicero uh, one thing that's kinda nice about uh, these ancient Romans is that they love to have their sculpture sculpted so we know exactly what Cicero looked like there he is just looks like a man you might run into on the street today kinda distinguished um, uh, as I said he was a great orator. he was also a politician uh, he uh, held half the power in Rome as he uh, served as a consul or somebody who was a leader and shared power with others he also had a time where he fell out of political favor and was exiled uh, he managed to escape execution and uh, was a very very big critic of Julius Caesar when I'm sorry of uh, Mark Antony when Mark Antony um, seized power after the assassination of Julius Caesar here's his biography I'm not going to read all this aloud um, I'll just leave this on the screen for a second and if you want to pause the video you can read it too just tells you his biography and uh, the amount of time he lived his major accomplishments uh, and he opposed Caesar and Mark Anthony as I mentioned and also talks about how he died he was assassinated by Mark Anthony here's another picture of Cicero now as for what he did in rhetoric first of all he wrote a very great book called De Oratore or On the Orator in the form of a dialogue again I won't read this all aloud but uh, obviously he was thinking about Plato and some of the earlier philosophers he decided to have this discussion about oratory and rhetoric um, on the basis of um, uh, dialectical sorts of back and forth and um, this is a really great work although I won't have you read it you'll notice that there are selections from Cicero on the website for the class um, he wrote um, as a teenager De Inventione on invention it's a handbook on oratory and later he dismissed it by the way invention of course was the centerpiece in Aristotle's rhetoric so obviously his early influence was to view Aristotle as the most influential and we do know that the Romans did have access to Aristotle's works um, Brutus was another dialogue it's kind of in a mutilated condition meaning that it's fragmentary we don't have all of its pieces but it's mostly historical and talks about orators um, also talks about some of the purposes of oratory which have become famous and I'll review those in a minute but you can pause this at any time and read these slides now you may remember that Aristotle wrote a book called topics and so did Cicero and in his topics is a toolkit for orators on the science of argument touching on the law rhetoric and philosophy setting out the various kinds of arguments available to the orator, rules of logic kinds of questions he may find himself facing it has similarities to Aristotle's topics and also Aristotle's rhetoric because Aristotle considered topics and rhetoric as companion subject matters remember rhetoric is the uh, counterpart of dialectic was what Aristotle said and then the orator different as opposed to de oratory on oratory is also written in the form of a letter on the topic of the perfect order includes the defense of Cicero's own oratorical style 
So um, Cicero was uh, very important and influential. He had many sources, including philosophy, politics, obviously the Greek sources, his own. He considered himself a philosopher, in addition to being a politician, an orator, a rhetorician. Uh, he was also a bit of a poet, and he wrote a lot of letters. And as I said, he's one of the most prolific people in history and one of the most written about people of history. Uh, I think one of my graduate professors wanted to point it out that uh, aside from Jesus Christ and Shakespeare, that Cicero may have been one of the most written about people in history. Um, Day and Wentioni married wisdom and eloquence, so a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of rhetoric. And he did not like Aristotle's notion of ethos. He thought it was inadequate, too limited. But actually, uh, most people think Aristotle's notion of ethos is pretty broad and pretty inclusive, but probably based too much in ethics and philosophy. Maybe that was uh, Cicero's dissatisfaction with it. Now, there's a, no a book that was written about the time of uh, Cicero called Ad Herenium, or Rhetoric to Herennius, meaning that it was dedicated to the Emperor Herennius. And it included the what's called the canon of rhetoric, invention, or inventio, dispositio, allocutio, pronunciatio, and memoria. And the translations of each of those is, inventio is invention or discovery, dispositio, organization. So when you write a speech, you put it in a certain order, you organize it. Elocutio, which is style. It is not equivalent to the word elocution, which we mean today as meaning a kind of delivery. But elocutio here is um, style, what words you pick. Pronunciatio, which is saying the speech. And finally, memoria, learning it or memorizing it. These are the canons of rhetoric. We still basically teach public speaking this way. We teach students find a topic, write an outline, pick the language, practice your delivery and make sure that you have enough practice that you remember what you're going to be talking about without having to refer to a manuscript. In other words, speak extemporaneously or from memory. Also, um, he introduced uh, some systems uh, f that are very important for the history of rhetoric. One is the system of stasis. This is also in Aristotle to a certain extent. This basically is the idea of a stopping point that when you're looking at an issue that you're going to argue about or give a speech about, it's always good to see where the stopping point is. Where is the issue right now? Like, for example, 10 years ago, the issue of gay marriage was one place. Today, it's a different place with a dramatically different view of that same issue. So you wouldn't start with where the issue was 10 years ago. You start with where the issue is now. Um, and then um, topics also introduces the notion, again, in Aristotle, of commonplaces, places that you normally go to for argument. You always talk about whether more of something is better than less of it, or vice versa. OK, and also in Cicero's De Oratari, which is kind of his masterpiece, he actually talks about three purposes of speech, speaking, speech, to teach, which means to instruct. So this is your informative speeches. To delight, those are your entertainment speeches, after dinner speeches. And, or maybe even a graduation speech, and to persuade the idea of moving some's w w someone's will or changing their behavior through language. He also wrote a very lengthy treatise about humor, but don't read it, it's not funny. Next, Marcus Fabius Quintilianus, or Quintilian. He defined rhetoric as the good man speaking well. He's the person who introduced the famous organization of the order of a speech, what comes first and what comes last. The introduction, the facts, the proof, the refutation, and the conclusion. And there's a Latin term for each of those, exordium, narratio, confirmatio, confutatio, and peroratio, sometimes even called peroration. That's actually an English word as well. Longinus wrote on the sublime. Um, it says that style is way more than mere adornment uh, and about the power of language aesthetically over people. And again, this was an influential work in literary criticism because it talked about the sublimity of certain texts. Uh, throughout history, the sublimity of the Bible has been talked about when you talk about the power in the imagery. So you don't say, for example, that the Bible for a person who's either having a revelation or receiving a biblical message 
is just adorned speech, you'd say that the images are powerful enough to render something true or believed. So imagery is very important. and Language is not merely um, just an adornment. So that's my quick overview of the Romans. Um, and I will be next doing um, a lecture about Christianity and rhetoric. And that will either be up today or tomorrow. So enjoy this one. And keep the papers coming in. The next one will be assigned this week. Thank you.